Samuel Johnson, and we'd be in a real neighborhood coffee place and have lots of real tea, and both of us would talk a lot, and now and then, listen to each other. <laughs> now, when you receive your membership to the LGBTQ plus community, you also get a lifetime supply of priceless questions and comments from others. <laughs> Give it up for Mary Lee. Actually, I'm going to just break it for a moment to say a couple of things from what Sarah was saying, just like sheer ego on my part. When I was a kid, I got one of the first of those, the pixie cuts, like I'm, I was 75 a couple of weeks ago, okay, so this was a while ago, and I had this little one, and I've always been me, I've always been a butch little child, but in any case, that summer my brother and I took the Greyhound bus from Clinton, Iowa, to California and back visiting relatives. You could do that in those days. And nine times that summer, people took me for a boy. I was quite happy about that, although it was one embarrassing moment when I'm heading toward the washroom or there's a restroom down there, and this woman says to me, hey kid, wrong door. <laughs> and then when I was in college and got to know gay people and everything, uh, I was visiting some of them in LA, and I did always have, I was at Berkeley, I always had hair down to here, sort of streaky blonde hair down to here. And I hear this one woman say to the other woman, she's so butch, but she's got long hair. <laughs> I don't know if I wore plaid then or not. <laughs> but anyway, so what I want to talk about, by the way, there's incredible plaid these days in Mark in the... <laughs> In the new Westminster Army and Navy, you just wouldn't believe it. that are sort of slightly padded so you know you can chop wood and also sit around the fireplace. It's just incredible, incredible. I didn't look at the women's, they probably all fitted, but I looked at the men's and you really only for 1999. I should get a pad for this. I'm going back there soon. Anyway. So I want to talk about the lesbian lifestyle because it wasn't too long ago I was at some kind of social event and uh, standing next to this woman it was lived in my housing co complex at the time and I just knew her like, you know, there was eight different households and she's pleasant, we had a little bit of rapport and so we're leaning there sort of holding a wall up in some event and out of absolutely nowhere this woman says to me, Mary Lee, I just want you to know I completely accept your lifestyle. <laughs> and then I started thinking about it. You know, what is the lesbian lifestyle? <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. You'll be so glad you came. <laughs> Because, <laughs> and let's say, what is it, la vie, la vie quotidienne, right? This is, we're bilingual here. So this is my, uh, like a daily life in the lesbian lifestyle. Okay, first of all, I get up at about seven in the morning. <laughs> Who else but lesbians, really? It's uh, seven in the morning. And then I go and like I walk my dog, as really all lesbians do, and a few others. <laughs> and then I, like, I have my breakfast, cold cereal standard by the sink, because that's what your lesbians who live alone do. You know, I go through the day, it, it, it's just again, so distinctive. Just so. <laughs> And by the time I walk that dog waiting for it to pee at 10 at night and go to bed, you know, I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to accept that lifestyle. <laughs> but, but to move on, um, naturally, again, think, if, if you think of lifestyle, I'm going to go back a ways, because as I say, okay, if I'm 75 or whatever, i got to write, I'll go back. It can get boring, but try to brace yourselves. So I was thinking... When I was when I was a teenager, um, I was 
I was always, I mean, I didn't know what uh, gayness was or what homosexuality was, right? You don't know, because if you're talking, like if I was born as, and yeah, I was in 1943, in 1955, 1957, there, there's nothing. There is nothing in the whole world. The only time I knew I was different, I knew that I loved little Brenda Murphy, okay? I knew that. But, you know, I, I, I just, I, I know it's different. I knew that it was something you wouldn't talk about, but there was no name, there was no nothing. And the only time I ever heard a word, finally, was um, I was reading the Reader's Digest, which we should not put down the Reader's Digest entirely. And it was this article on what, it, you know, it's really, it's not entirely bad. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it, it was an article on, I'm sitting there, we lived in Clinton, Iowa at the time, I was on this, in this converted farmhouse, and uh, it said, what teenagers fear. And it lists, it said, one of the things that teenagers have fears of is homosexuality. I said, that's me, that's it, that's the word. There was something, it was a relief, like that I had, not even late, but there was a place where I sort of fit, not that I knew anybody else or anything like that, but it's just like plunk, yes. But I still knew that I was different in this bad. We were Seventh-day Adventists, and so it doesn't make it a lot easier. Huh? Anything? So I go on, I go to college, go to university, and I go to Berkeley, and, and being whatever I was, I knew at the time that I had to go to a big school where I could be anonymous because I'd already had these crushes on girlfriends, only they didn't do anything, right? And then it would be so frustrating, I would hate them. You know, I would turn on them, whatever that was. And so I knew this was bad, I knew it was unhealthy, this was in high school. And so I thought, if I go to this Ivy League that they want me to go to, there'll be just 600 other girls and everybody will know everybody, everybody will know about me, and I had some sense that I would have this crush on someone and it would, I would kill myself or I would fail. And actually, failing wasn't, I wasn't big on that because there, the way I would compensate for knowing that I was different and bad was to be the best at everything and to be the smartest at everything. I remember going into San Diego High School. We were all had honors classes and teachers with master's degrees, and this was in the public school system. And we had this course in world history, and he had two-hour exams over two days. And this, I had never, in fact, PhD and everything, worked as hard as I did in 10th grade, 10th grade. And so we would have these things, and I heard people say, they said, oh, Bill, he always is first. I thought, never again, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, it was never again. But because my thinking was, not just that I was competitive, of course, I could live with that, but when people would find out and would say bad things about me, which was my fear, they would have to at least deal with, well, she may be evil and bad, but she's real smart, you know? <laughs> And I must say, that's covered me throughout life. That's why I'm such a pain in the ass to be around, because it's not just knowing everything. I have to be right, and that's particularly difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> Although, me and my sister, we know that it is true. We are right. But, you know, again, it's not, it's not the most popular trait I have. Um, so, and, and there in Berkeley, I mean, I was, again, always openly... There, you didn't even have a word for gay. I was always open about the relationships I had because I did have a little shred of integrity there or something where I thought I'd heard people, and I may be being uh, insulting by saying this, I've heard, I heard people even then, they would say, oh, my friend, oh, my friend and I are going to do this. And I felt like that was some kind of betrayal, and I thought I'm not going to be someone who says, oh, my friend that they're going to know who that is, they're going to know we're together. It also, of course, releases the pressure, because they already know if they're going to shoot you down, you're going to get shot right away, and then you can you know, get relaxed and everything like that. And so, but it was still a very narrow, narrow world. You just knew each other, and you knew your other friends, and then I just ran around like crazy, because it was an anonymous place. But every, and, and the thing is, I don't know if you all run into this, but how do you define when you're gay, when you're a woman, and when you're 1961, 
how do you define your relationship? Because how are you different from just real good friends? And to the outside world, how are you different from just good friends? And the only way I could think of it was was sex. That's what made the difference. And so if you were having sex with this person, it like it, it was rather tiring because I had to make sure that each night we made love. Because <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just that I was sexually uh, obsessed, which was true also, but <laughs> but otherwise you're just laying there, lying there, whichever the grammar is, you're just laying there next to this other girl. You don't just lay there in bed next to other girls. I mean, you, you don't do that kind of thing, you see? And so it was very, very difficult to have because there was no structure around us, right? No structure. And I remember I used to think in my own uh, big, uh, uninformed way, because there was no way to inform yourself. I used to think if there's something, if there was only something around us, you know, sort of like only some kind of structure around us, which now we know, we like marriage, although 50% of all marriages end and all that, but, but, you know, there were things, there was nothing around us, and so the only thing that, that made you together was the passion, the sexuality, and as soon as that ended, you know, and it's still a little true today, you went off to someone else, and they went off to someone else, a lesbian sand pile, right? That's what they... <laughs> You know, and, and this one girlfriend I had, this one girlfriend I had, she's mean, she was a mean person, but very astute, and she said, she said one time, she said, straight people get married and gay people go into debt together. And she was right, because you could like uh, buy a car together or something, and it was sort of a contract. Sad, but true. Right? And then the other thing, in terms of being shaped by this almost nameless thing, and I slept with guys all the time because it partly, you still think, oh, I hope it's not me, I hope it's not true. Maybe someday you'll feel some. I mean, it all worked, but you know, really. And, um, <laughs> and so I did the dumbest things, the highest risk things to prove to myself that, that you know, I wasn't only or exclusively or stuck with being gay. And I look back one particular one, I meet some guy who's like listening to this Brett Kavanaugh guy on preppy guy from Yale and Phillips Andover. And he flew me down to LA to spend a weekend with him. And uh, we hadn't had sex yet at that point, but we were waiting till I get to LA. And he picks me, his, I knew his last name, his first name, this is not his real name, James Malinowski. And I get there, and he picks me up at the airport in a nice Jaguar, the nice Jaguar XK, whatever, really nice. And he picks me up, and I had on my iMagnon uh, cashmere uh, black, white outfit and a dress, well, it was a skirt, and the Capizio shoes, need I say, is there anyone who knows Capizio shoes? Uh, okay, be like Kalina's or something. So anyway, he picks me up, and on the door of that car are stuck on initials. First of all, what kind of class are you that you got stuck on initials? Could you at least have them painted on? But they were not his initials. They were not his initials. And I thought, Marilyn, what have you done? And I got in the car and we spent a rather tedious weekend, although I did learn how to eat in expensive restaurants. I learned how to rack, relax in those. And I asked him, what is that? And he said, oh, he didn't like it. He didn't like his Polish last name. So he took a name like it would be like Rutherford something rather. I will say, because you can Facebook people now, he had some private psychiatric institute in New York City. I think he's as screwy then as he was now. But anyway, <laughs> so he did the dumbest things, and that was lifestyle, that was lesbian lifestyle, and the narrowness of it, and the, the, the lack of framework, right? So we can sort of leap, 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 because we have to leap, and it's getting a little late, okay? So if we were talking about the life, lesbian lifestyle now, First of all, the world is a lot broader, right? It's a lot of way around us. Uh, but digital things and all that. And now, in the lesbian lifestyle, you can read in the New Yorker yesterday about women trying to escape from Chechnya and being captured and being raped. And if they go home, they will be killed. And they have nowhere to go. And the men in Chechnya, anyway, you can read that, that's part of the lesbian lifestyle out there. And that's a part of what we know and what we live with and have to live with. And we had our person who's running for office and we can do things kind of like here, right? But, and, and whether or not, and there are some straight people here that I welcome. 
there's straight people, there's all kinds of people here tonight. But it doesn't make any difference because we're all here, in a sense, for a reason. We're here for our friends, we're here about these things and all that, right? And so there's you, now lesbian lifestyle. Yes, you can know all about that, and you can't, I think, turn away anymore. But we also are here because it's fun, because we can be open, because we like each other, because we love each other. You know, at least theoretically. And, <laughs> and, and we can walk out of here safe. We're not going to be punched out outside the street. We can probably, eventually, most of the parents deal with it. Mine were always fine. My mother had done anything, whether to lose me, I knew that. So in any case, we have all of this now, too. And so it's a lesbian lifestyle that I think we all can accept. And I thank you. Thank you.